Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, my hometown, right on the edge of the prairie. We've had the start of spring out there, ladybugs appearing, first sign, along with spiders and ants, more than birds, ladybugs. Get up in the morning and fix yourself coffee, and here comes a ladybug crawling across your counter. People have been warning ladybugs for years to fly away home. Your house is on fire, your children are gone, but ladybugs persist, gentle gentle things. There was a little rain early in the week which freshened everything up and made the grass beautiful. A little wind came with it and in this storm, you couldn't really call it a storm, but an old oak tree blew down or maybe just got dizzy and fell over, but it took out a transformer and power was out in town for about four hours and people were able to discover once again how well we can get along without communications. A whole communications industry, radio, television, the internet, all of it, just an impediment actually. It's just a, just a work program for people without manual skills. <laughs> people stepped back into the 19th century. They went for walks, they listened to things around them. They felt a burden lift, the burden of communication. And then power was restored and the punishment resumed. <laughs> birds arriving in town, the sandhill cranes have arrived. The largest birds in Minnesota, wings spread six, seven feet, stand four, five feet tall. They've been coming in for the last few years in large numbers. Carl Krebsbach and, and his friend Earl have been making habitat for waterfowl down in the slough and along the south side of the lake, and they discovered that grape jelly will attract sandhill cranes, so they spread it on boards, and they come in by the hundreds and hundreds, enormous birds, their arrival in town, always like the beginning of a horror movie. You're out <laughs> hanging clothes on the line, and you see enormous shadows passing passing across the grass and you throw yourself over your children in the sandbox, you cover them with your body and you see sandhill cranes coming in. It's attracted tourists to Lake Wobegon. What else would draw people to this little town but sandhill cranes? They've come in to see them come in. Hundreds and hundreds of people have come up from the cities. Don't ask us how we know they're not from here, but you can just tell. And it's meant great business for the Chatterbox Cafe. Dorothy's added tuna to the menu. Not the kind that comes in cans, but the kind that you grill. I mean, you want to grill it well, of course, but so it's like the stuff that comes in cans. But. <laughs> the sidetrack tap has added single malt scotch. Arts, Bates, and Night Arrest Motel has put out a sign, no vacancy. Not a neon sign, but painted on a wood board. <laughs> no vacancy. Art is Norwegian. He's always been suspicious of strangers. He only got into the hospitality business because his father was in it, and he liked it because it left his afternoons free. But he basically doesn't like people, so he doesn't welcome them. He got all these warning signs all over. Don't clean fish on picnic tables. How many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> Where were you people brought up? Ring doorbell once. Don't ring and ring and ring. If I do not answer, it means I am occupied elsewhere. If you ring and ring and ring and I come, you will be sorry. A word to the wise. <laughs> Ralph at the Pretty Good Grocery did not welcome visitors either, though it meant business for him. He sold a great deal more Braunschweiger, but he's sick of making Braunschweiger, so he doesn't need the extra business. This is Braunschweiger that for the last five years has won the grand sweepstakes of the Minnesota Association of Meat Processors. He's done well with beef jerky and pork sausage, but 
the Braunschweiger won the big prize and it got written up in the Minneapolis Star and Tribune taste section. And suddenly he went from selling 10 pounds of it a week to selling 400 pounds of Braunschweiger, which he never cared for <laughs> in the first place. And to turn out that much Braunschweiger every week, inevitably you begin to loathe and despise it. So he discovered he could only make this in the dark. And it seemed to help to listen to Wagner, music from Das Rheingold. <laughs> Pounds and pounds and pounds, tons of it. He tried to get help. He hired a butcher, but the butcher was alcoholic. <laughs> and that week, the Braunschweiger had an odd, sour smell to it, and it had to be thrown away. He hired teenagers to come and help, but they were moody and irresponsible, and he spent more time supervising them than if he did the job himself. So he perseveres. And when people come to see the Sandhill Cranes, he gets up to 600 pounds of Braunschweiger every week. He turned vegetarian years, <laughs> years, years ago. He's going to give it up as soon as he gets the last kid through college. Braunschweiger has put three kids through college, and now he's got the fourth one, his oldest kid, still in <laughs> college. She's in graduate school. She's been in history and in English, and now she's in philosophy studying for a master's degree. She's 36. <laughs> She's what they call a spasm child, simply pray and send money. And <laughs> the money comes from Braunschweiger. But when she's done, he is done for good. This is the spring blues at Ralph's Pretty Good Grocery, the necessity of Braunschweiger. It's like the Hansons who make maple syrup every year because the maple trees are there and they were brought up to waste not want not so they go out every spring and they hang the buckets on the trees and the sap drips into the buckets and a week later they go out and collect it and they pour it into an iron kettle and they boil it and boil it and boil it for a day and a half until the water is evaporated and it's down to syrup and they put it into glass jars and they give it away to their friends because the Hansons don't care for maple syrup. <laughs> anymore. They like store-bought syrup, the synthetic <laughs> syrup. Mrs. Butterworth's is what they like. They just make it because they feel obligated to. This is, you see, why people move to the desert of Arizona. There are no maple trees there. There's no great demand for Braunschweiger in Arizona. It's the spring blues in Lake Wobegon because it's the season when it's assumed that we should be lighthearted and happy. This place is a terrible burden on people and, and they feel despondent almost right away because, of course, you shouldn't when the weather is this lovely. Carl Krebsbach has the blues, has the blues, and his, and his antidote for it is to fish. This is the solution of so many men in town, a chance to be alone out on water, or in his case, in a fishing shack. He doesn't only build habitat for waterfowl, he also built a fishing shack for himself. This is the shack that he drags out onto the ice in the winter to ice fish, and then it pulls it back onto the point, which is just to, just to the east of the slough, he puts it up there on concrete blocks and it sits there. It's his fishing shack. And he tells people he's going out to fish, though he never does. He just goes and sits in the shack, which is comfortable, which he's outfitted with, with a coffee maker and a cot and a table and books. His wife says, I don't understand how a person can go out there and just fish for hours at a time. Well, he said it all depends on who you go fishing with. He goes fishing with John Grisham. He goes fishing with Tolstoy, <laughs> with Mickey Spillane, with Ayn Rand. He fishes with anybody who's written a book. He buys them cheap, never spends more than 65 cents on a book, hauls them out there, has them in a big bookcase in his shack. 
He goes out there because he is married to a good woman, and this, of course, can be exhausting for a man. <laughs> a woman who is always straightening and fixing, who is mopping up spills even before they occur, who is editing what you say and who is correcting your grammar, and if you should not finish a sentence, she will finish it for you. You're setting the table and her hand slips in to straighten out the knife and the fork and put the napkin where it should be and the water glass where it should be. And after a while, he just says, well, I think I'm going to go out and fish for a while. <laughs> she tries to get him to go to the seniors' lunch at the Lutheran Church every Wednesday. They have good food there. They have meatloaf and they have mashed potatoes and they have strawberry shortcake for dessert, but he doesn't want to go. He hasn't come to think of himself as a senior yet. He doesn't care for those people. He went to high school with many of them and <laughs> didn't like them then. <laughs> but you can't say this, so he just says, you know, I promised somebody I was going to go fishing. And he goes out to his shack. And he heats up some water and makes some instant coffee. And he pulls a book down and he makes himself a nest in the cot. And he sits and he, and he reads. He's been reading a book called The Black Widow about a female murderer who walks around in the woods looking for bodies of water to find men who are alone <laughs> by a body of water. And she comes up behind them and she has a hook in her hand and she hooks them by the lower lip and she drags them into the woods, and she hangs them up by the lower lip from a tree. She pulls them up, and she slits them right down the front of their bodies, and she opens them up, and she guts them, and she skins them, and she covers them. She covers them in a sort of a cornmeal. He was reading this book, and he heard a knock at the door. And it was his friend Earl. He said, Carl! Carl slipped the book under the cot, and he pulled the TV tray on which he has all of his fly-tying stuff, the little horse hairs, and the feathers, and the hooks, and the line. He pulled it there in front of the cot, and he picked up a hook and he said, yeah, I'm here. Earl opened the door. He walked in. He took a look. He said, you know, you don't seem to be making much progress with tying flies there. That looks about the same as it did last year. <laughs> well, Carl said, Carl said, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. <laughs> Haste makes waste. The race is not necessarily to the swift. We have all sorts of sayings to cover this very situation to explain laziness. That's the news from Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good-looking, and all the children are above average.